So um, tonight we're going to address the issue of diabetes and vascular diseases of the eye. Um, it's a fascinating topic, it's relevant to most people in this room and many of you will either know or suffer from some of these conditions. The eye, as you can see illustrated here, is a photograph and it shows obviously a lot of hemorrhaging and a few white spots that you can see um, just above the big white circle. We're going to come and explain how these images are obtained and what they mean uh, as we go through the talk. Now vascular diseases, as we intimated before, are the number one killer uh, in the world. They're, they're chronic, they have an insidious onset, most people don't know that they're suffering from these conditions and so therefore screening is necessary to pick up people at risk in the population and treat them before they run into complications. The eye plays two roles here. One is it can be a diagnostic tool and we can look into an eye as you see on the right here and make decisions about this that help the physicians manage the systemic disease. This is not an eye disease. This is acute hypertension in a 22-year-old um, gentleman who if this is not treated as a matter of urgency will be dead in a matter of days or weeks. And so this is a medical emergency, and sometimes it's picked up, he's unaware of it. He has a few headaches, somebody sends him along to have a look into the eye, and we find this, with swelling of the nerve at the back of the eye, little white spots which represent mini-strokes in the retina and hemorrhaging, and you can see at the very centre a little linear array of what we call exudates, little yellow dots, and these eventually form a star shape around the centre. Now, as well as actually being a marker of disease, the eye is also a target organ itself. And clearly, if this disease isn't going to kill you, and you carry on having this sort of damage being done, it's going to affect your eyesight. So the eye itself becomes quite important, um, both for diagnosing disease and secondly as a target of that disease. These are blinding as well as lethal. Now, we're going to, in this lecture, discuss the discovery of the vascular system, and it seems so obvious to us nowadays, but it um, took many thousands of years before very intelligent people realised what was going on and how it worked. The circulation of the blood, we're going to talk about diabetes and then hypertension, and imaging of the eye, and if we have time, we'll discuss some of the more fascinating but rarer vascular diseases, and I'll show you some gory pictures if you uh, wish. Now, as always, we come back to China because there's so many myths about China and Chinese medicine and there's so much truth hidden there in a language that's barely decipherable to most Westerners, as you can see on the, the right. This is the Yellow Emperor's Manual of Medicine. There are two texts, each of 81 chapters, and it's put in a question and answer format. The reason it was done in this format was so that you wouldn't offend a particular emperor and have your head cut off or be expelled from the country. Huang Di is the Yellow Emperor. He was also called Xian Yuan, which means the vehicle man, because he was believed to have brought the wheeled cart to ancient China. And he's one of the five uh, legendary emperors, and he was the head one. At that time, they were developing in China a sophisticated agricultural and um, movement uh, system using waterways. And these canals and irrigations and natural waterways made people think that maybe the body had a similar way of uh, transmitting around. And so a theory arose that there could be a series of channels which gave life-giving um, fluids to the tissues. The fluid was called qi and the pathways through which it flowed were the meridians. And this is the basis of some Chinese medicine even today. Now, they're not actually blood vessels themselves and there isn't an anatomical um, site of where these vessels are that we would recognise in the Western uh, view. And the theory goes on to yin and yang and the balance of these forces. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, um, the ancient Greeks were developing a theory that health depended on four humours, uh, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm and blood, sanguis. Now, Galen of Pergamon, who was around a little bit after the time of Christ, um, Pergamon was an interesting place to grow up. It had a brilliant library, second only to Alexandria. And Galen learned his trade by being a physician to the gladiators. 
and uh, and also these gladiators were particularly good um, stable because they were the gladiators of the high priest of Asia. Galen had a genius for medical research, and he used the two things that were available to him: the Barbary ape, the North African monkey, and ungulates, so sort of cattle. And he had a theory that nutritive blood was made by the liver and it was carried through veins to the organs where it was consumed. And then there was a vital spirit made by the heart, which went through the otherwise empty arteries, and an animal spirit made by the brain, derived from blood, which came in the reticulum, a series of blood vessels that are found in animals, but as we discussed in a previous lecture, not in man. And the theory is the heart sucks the blood in from the veins, the blood then flows through pores in the septum of the heart, from one ventricle to the other, and this ebb and flow leads to consummation of the blood being used up by the tissues. A very powerful idea. I mean, it sounds nuts to us today, but actually, if you go along and you dissect a dead body of an animal or a human, you'll find something that's really quite interesting. You will find that the veins are full of clotted or clotting blood, and you'll find the arteries are empty. So this system that he developed of ebbing and flowing of blood through the veins, the arteries being empty, and then the brain contributing its own spirit. Very powerful, lasted a long time. Then a chap called Ibn al-Nafis, who was born in Damascus at 1213, and went to the local medical hospital there, which is very, very famous. This was not a good time to grow up in this part of the world. You had the Crusades going on, and various infighting between factions, and a lot of political turmoil. On top of this, the Mongols invade in, 10, in 1260 and totally destroy your town, your library, and burn all the books. Meanwhile, if you're a sensible and chap, you've moved off to um, safer places like Cairo, and there was this great stimulus to write comprehensive treaties of medicine, because, and also of all sciences, because they realised the knowledge that had been gathered for a thousand years was about to be lost by these chaps from the Far East who were using them for bonfires. So he did many books. In fact, one of them, he planned to have 80 volumes of it. And in one of them, the commentary of the compound drugs, is where he describes the pulmonary transit. So long before we in the West had any idea that blood was moving from the heart to the lungs to be oxygenated, it's clearly stated in this gentleman's book. And he says, the blood from the right chamber of the heart must arrive at the left chamber, but there's no direct pathway between them, which is contradistinction to what Galen had said. The thick septum of the heart is not perforated and doesn't have pores. The blood must flow through the vena arteriosa, which is the pulmonary artery, so it goes to the lungs. And there it's spread through the tissues of the lungs where it becomes oxygenated. The expert on this particular text is delayed in a tube at the moment, but if you have any questions of a burning matter, he will be here, and I shall direct any of those hard questions to him. <laughs> Now, one of our local boys, William Harvey from Barts, on April the 16th, 1666, just down the road at uh, Nightdale Street near St. Paul's, addressed the College of Physicians. And he said, I finally saw that blood forced by the action of the left ventricle into the arteries, impelled by the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. So he'd rediscovered what had been discovered previously. Now, some people have thought this is because he'd read the book and was cheating. And in fact, there was a... Latin translation of that book available in northern Italy when he was studying as a doctor in Padua. However, that particular translation does not contain the part on the pulmonary transit of the blood. So this could well have been a completely independent uh, discovery by Harvey. And that's how we accept the story in the West and we believe that that is true for, us, for a lot of evidence. Secondly, what he did was to take this further and proposed that the whole system was a closed system, that blood was not being consumed and used up. There was a finite amount of blood, and it was being pumped around in two dual circulations. Now, there's a big problem with this theory, is, is that how does it get from one bit to the other bit? And he postulated that there might be very, very, very small vessels. But there was no way of knowing this, because no one could see them, they were so small. So there was some scepticism about Harvey and his theory. This is the experiment he demonstrated to King Charles, which shows that the blood moves only in one direction in the veins. So he puts a ligature on to make the veins stand out, 
and then he strokes the vein in one direction, nothing happens, strokes it in the other direction, it's emptied, and it doesn't refill. The veins are preventing back flow, but once it has been emptied out, this is actually showing that there's a unidirectional flow. So what we needed to find these small vessels, and also to disprove that there were tiny vessels leading from one part of the heart to the other, was a microscope. And we had a bit of a discussion on this in Gresham at Wadham just a couple of weeks ago. In 1595, Zacharias Janssen, who was a very interesting character, who was wanted for murder, uh, counterfeiting, and had several death penalties um, over his head. But eventually he managed to appeal so successfully and boringly they gave up and let him off. With his father, he invents the microscope. And he invents the microscope by turning a telescope upside down. And it sounds ridiculous, but that's essentially what it was. And here is one of those early first compound microscopes. Completely ignored because of the more exciting cousin, the telescope. And it was well over 50 years before anyone thought there was anything of interest in it at all. And this was in a letter by the Dutch ambassador to the French king, who mentions this invention. It was another 50 years to pass before anyone bothered using it for any scientific research. And that was by a Yorkshire chap called Henry Power, who published a rather inarticulate poem describing the wonders of the telescope and also some rather crude woodcuts of drawings. Of course, this was overtaken by Robert Hooke, who produced those beautiful, immaculate drawings in micrographia um, and really popularised uh, microscopy as not only an art form but also as a major science. As we know, he was a fellow of the Royal Society in London and had close links with Gresham College and also with Wadham College. His micrographia was published in 1665. Two things are interesting and they're of relevance to this lecture. He called he, the empty little pockets of air that he found in some of the tissues, he called cells, because they reminded him of the cells of the monasteries in the Carthusian. These are the building blocks of life, and really, really important, major, major discovery. He also modified and improved the telescope and this is a reproduction in the Science Museum, um, which shows what it would have looked like from one of the drawings of Hooke's original on the left. It's getting very close to what a modern microscope might look like. And I see Frank is nodding sagely as he recognises the little mirror at the bottom. And when we were young men, these were the microscopes we had to do our sections on. Uh, we didn't use candlelight like Hooke did, but um, we had artificial lights then. Now, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek went down a completely different path. He was a Dutch draper, lived in Delft, and he had no formal scientific training whatsoever. But he had to use magnifying glasses to count the amount of threads in a cloth. And he made his own microscopes. Here's an example. Um, and he made them by secret process. Now, this is not a compound microscope. This is a single lens, a tiny lens. And the object of interest is placed on the pin you can see and the little micrometer screws move it up and down as you look at it through fantastically high magnification. In 1673 he sends his findings to the Royal Society and they're published. Now this was the first peer-reviewed scientific journal but what's more amazing than that is these original specimens still exist and they've been re-examined by Brian Ford um, who's a great microscopist. And um, these are some of the things that he could find. So Leeuwenhoek was actually seeing the red blood cells. And here is a picture of red blood cells in the bottom right. So astonishing magnification. A real big improvement on the lower magnification that was achieved with the compound microscopes. And they could see structures that couldn't be seen in England with the compound microscopes. Um, there was so much controversy because he found a single-cell organism, and of course this does not fit in with the uh, theology of the time, that the Royal Society sends a deputation over to Delft to have a look at it. So this is peer reviewing with knobs on, and they actually find that everything he said is completely true, so they elect him to be a fellow of the Royal Society. He kept this totally secret because he didn't want anyone else to know what he did. And when he was up working, he wasn't actually, he was just lying with his feet crossed, reading books and so on. But he pretended he was working, and they imagined he was polishing lenses to a high degree of sphericity to get this. Actually, how he made them was to extend a very fine piece of 
glass thread over a hot flame and it beads at the end. And if you snap it off, you end up, sometimes in a hundred, with a really good magnifying lens. And that is what is placed in the uh, objective there. On the right, these are the folded packets of seeds that are still in the um, letters that he sent to the Royal Society and were subsequently examined by Brian Ford. I actually asked Brian Ford uh, by email whether I could show a picture of some of the original Leeuwenhoek microscopes. Um, I didn't get a response, so I wasn't able to show one of those, but uh, this is a, a copy um, of, of one and shows very much of what these instruments were like. Now, we can now see things that are quite small, and we can see blood cells, but we still haven't got that connection between the right-hand side of the body and the left-hand side of the body's circulation. It's got to go there unless it's being made by two completely separate different systems and is being consumed, as Galen said. Mel Piggy comes along. He was born in the year that Harvey published his book, De Morto Cordis, which described the circulation of the blood. He studied Aristotelian philosophy at Bologna and graduated as a doctor in 1667. And he sent journal articles to the Royal Society, which was an unusual practice in, in those days, particularly from his part of the world. And four years after Harvey's death, he's looking in the lungs of a dissected frog and he sees little tiny channels which are transmitting small corpuscles of blood. He discovered the capillaries, the missing link, that showed that circulation of the blood was indeed true. However, as <laughs> many people in this age came into trouble with the church, and down in Rome, his works are given pretty harsh condemnation by his peers, and in fact, some of the students he taught it is our firm opinion that the anatomy of the exceedingly small, which has been extolled in these very times, is of absolutely no use to the physician. A cry that pathologists hear from time to time, even today. Following this work, we're able to develop a schema of how this is a simple human being, well, or a complicated human being simplified, and this is the tube map of the vascular system, if you like. And what it shows is that essentially it's um, uh, a system that uh, pumps blood from the heart going out to the right, and then it pumps into the channels going up to the head, down to the arms, to the GI tract, the kidneys, and to your legs. This is an in-series system. So it works the same as electricity does with light bulbs. And we're able to control the pressure by the um, width and tone of the blood vessels which means that blood pressure is maintained and you have enough blood pressure if you're a giraffe not to keel over when you put your head up and we have enough blood pressure to supply our kidneys far away from the heart or our arms when we lift them up. There's one bit which goes in series and that's when it goes into the gut because the supply that leaves from the gut goes to the liver taking the nutrients that, are taken, that have come from the body. And this is an in series system. They both feed back into the venous system where they go back up into the heart, where they're distributed into a second circulation, which is through the lungs, where this deoxygenated, used-up blood is resupplied and comes back from the lungs bright red, full of oxygen, ready to be distributed to the rest of the body. And this is the system that we would recognise today. So what can go wrong? Well, we mentioned before that vascular diseases are the number one killer. What do I mean by that? Hearts, myocardial infarction, heart attacks. Brains, strokes, kidneys, renal failure. Plus there's a heap of metabolic diseases such as diabetes and there's also the disease of high blood pressure, the silent killer, which together are probably the two most common pathways to damage this system. And I mentioned earlier there are other rarer causes, inflammatory vasculitis, clotting disorders, infections, syphilis, congenital and hereditary causes. And... Uh, there's a problem with all of this, is because all this is going on in the body, there's an imaging problem. You can't see it. That's why you don't know what's going on. But you can see it in the eyes, and that's why the eyes are a useful window for what's going on in the body. Now, blood pressure itself was only really discovered very late on. Although they knew there was a pulse, palpation of the pulse, it was sort of used as a diagnostic tool, but it wasn't thought about in any great detail. No one had measured there was a pressure in the circulatory system. 
until Stephen Hales came along, who was born in Kent, studies at Cambridge, and then becomes a curate in Teddington, where he did a lot of his scientific work, and in fact it's where he is buried. He was a great experimenter, and he was elected Fellow of the Royal Society in 1718, and he produced a number of things, including a ventilator for St George's Hospital, and uh, some people wish it could have been transferred further south with the changes in the 1970s, um, also for ships in Newgate Prison, which improved the survival of people in those institutions. Um, he measured the pressure, the sap pressure in plants, and this is experiment doing this. And that actually really gave him his name, the vegetable statics on the rising um, sap of plants. Then he produced a volume six years later on hemostatics, which was the force of the blood in various animals. And how he did this was to tie a mare down and open the crural artery. He cannulated this artery with a brass tube from which came a um, glass tube and into it the blood came up and started pumping up and down with the strokes of the heart. And he was able to measure that and I, I love the measurements. It was a sixth of an inch in diameter and the blood rose eight foot three inches, rising and falling two to four inches with each pulse. Clearly this was a major step forward but couldn't be used in clinical practice on a regular basis. So it fell to the Germans to work out how to do this non-invasively. And Carl von Wehrholt realised that you could, instead of cannulating, you could measure the pressure indirectly by how much pressure it took to cut the pulse off. And that would be proportional to what the pressure was in the tubes that you're cutting off. And this was the instrument he invented. And um, you put the pressure on, you could measure the pressure, and as you took the pressure off, the pulse came back. That gave an idea of what the blood pressure was. Somebody thought it might be a good idea to use an inflatable bag and fill it with water, and this was a bit easier. The BMJ at this stage opined that sphygma manometers, which were what these call, pauperize our senses and weaken our clinical acuity. You see, you can diagnose people with high blood pressure by looking at them from the other side of the room, of course. You don't have to measure it. And then somebody thought it'd be a good idea not to use water and use air, and this was a good idea. Harvey Cushing, who's the famous American neurosurgeon, was visiting Pavia, and he found this device being used by anaesthetists, and it was saving lives, because neuroanesthesiology is very dangerous, and these anaesthetists kill people on a regular basis. And uh, if you can find out that they're losing blood or their blood pressure is falling, you can do something about it, um, and you can save their lives. So he brought this back to the United States. And then the elaborately named Scipioni Rivarocci, who was uh, qualified in Turin, he published a paper on Un Nuovo Sphygma Manometro, which was the device that we use today. So it's an ancient device, and it is still used. We now have smaller and more digital kids, which and whatever, but you can still find these hanging around on the wards. Most of them are taken out of the NHS hospitals, amazingly, because they contain mercury, and this is a hazard. And um, if this mercury is spilt on the floor... So they ended up in waste tips, where the mercury's ended up in our drinking water. So probably it would have been safer not to have destroyed them and kept them on the wards in the first place. It's interesting things. They hardly ever broke. They were pretty indestructible. Now, there's another way you can have a look at what's going on in the vascular system. You can listen to the heart. And in 1816, Lenech was asked to examine an obese young woman. And he wasn't too keen to put his head onto a heart underneath the enormous pendulous appendages. And he thought what he did was to roll up some papers into a cylinder and listen to it from afar, which reminds me of my first ward round going along when the SHO on the ward round put the stethoscope under the lady's breast, stood back with his hands in his pockets, was sort of listening to the heartbeat like this, to the amazement of everyone else on the ward. So he was another Lenech into the future. But nevertheless, he heard the beating of the heart, and he heard it more distinctly than if he had put his ear onto the chest. The two sounds that we hear are lub, as the ventricles contract and the blood is then pushed against them, and then dup, which comes just a moment later, which is the second part of the heartbeat when the um, pulmonary artery bounces back and the valves snap shut. Korotov, sorry, Korotov uh, in Moscow, um, he was the surgeon in the Manchurian War in 1904, and he became interested in blood vessels, as many surgeons in war zones do. And he thought we could use this stethoscope system to actually use for measuring the blood pressure. So instead of actually palpating the heart as we cut the pulse down, he listened to it. And not only did he hear the sounds coming back, as the, he heard them coming back in two distinct phases, phase one and phase two. 
And what he was measuring indirectly here was the top end of the pressure wave as the blood is forced out, and then the second, the diastolic pressure. So, what is the normal blood pressure? Well, it's formed by blood being pumped out of the heart under pressure into the arteries. And there's a mean arterial pressure, which is the sort of the average of what this pressure is. And clearly, when it's at full flow being pushed out, we have a high pressure. And then when the heart is relaxing, we then have a low pressure. And you can measure this. And it's essentially proportional to what the output of the heart is, how much blood is being pumped, and how much the resistance is in the system. So cardiac output versus resistance would should give you what the pressure is. Now, the aorta and the arteries have the highest pressure, and there's about 95 millimetres of mercury. That's the mean pressure, by the way, not the, the highest. And it reduces only very slightly for the reasons that I told you before, because of the, the calibre changing. But it drops precipitously as it goes into the capillary circulation, as you can see on the graph in the bottom, with blood pressure dropping off. And eventually, when it comes back to the heart, distributed through the veins, it's nearly zero. And it's um, as the breathing is coming, it fluctuates up and down to even less than zero. So that is how blood pressure is generated and shifts blood around the system. We've mentioned systole and diastole. Systole is when the blood is being ejected by the left ventricle, the maximum pressure here. And the left ventricle then relaxes for refilling. The pressure in the aorta falls, and that is the diastolic pressure. Normally, this is 120, the systolic, and the diastolic should be 80 millimetres or less. It varies in certain populations, and it varies with age, and it varies with disease. I measured mine today for interest since I was giving this talk, and during theatre this morning, it was 95 diastolic and 179 systolic. So, um, perhaps I shouldn't do that again. <laughs> so that's the normal pressure. Now... What is high blood pressure? What can cause high blood pressure? Well, there's several things that could do it. Since we know it's proportional to the cardiac output, if you've got a lot of blood, so you increase the amount of blood volume, you're going to get high blood pressure. How are you going to get more blood in the system? You're going to have more fluid in the system because you've got too much salt in it, and salt will attract the fluid in. So maybe abnormal salt handling by the kidney initiates blood pressure, and then that leads to secondary changes further down, which damages the small blood vessels, and then this maintains this vicious circle, and then you get a long-term damage with thickening and hardening of the arteries. High blood pressure, hypertension, we're going to call it from now on, affects about a billion people word worldwide. More than 20% of Americans are hypertensive, and a third of them don't know it, which is amazing. That's why it's called a silent killer. And it's usually completely asymptomatic. And if your blood pressure isn't measured, it may only be recognised when a damaging event occurs. A stroke in the brain, a stroke in the eye, a haemorrhage in the eye, a myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack, renal dysfunction, renal failure, or visual problems. Now, the mechanisms that generate blood pressure are known in the normal. But what is less well known is how we maintain and sustain high blood pressure in the abnormal uh, situation of hypertension. There are many possible mechanisms, and I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but you need to know some of them to understand the treatments that are used. There's a system called the renin angiotensin system, which affects a chemical called aldosterone in the kidneys. Now, renin comes from the kidneys. It produces angiotensin in the tissues, particularly in the lungs. And then this, in turn, stimulates the release of aldosterone in the adrenal cortex. So angiotensin increases vascular resistance, and therefore the blood pressure. Aldosterone increases the sodium reabsorption by the kidneys, and therefore the amount of blood. So this mechanism is a vicious circle in itself. You're increasing the cardiac output, and you're increasing the pressure you've got to push it through. Secondly, you've got sympathetic nervous system acting on the tone of the muscles, and stress can cause the blood vessels to constrict. Um, or exercise, is when it has to increase because you've got to push the blood around faster to get it moving. And then there's vascular endothelial function due to nitrous oxide and various toxins. And one of those toxins is glucose. And it appears that endothelium production, um, which enhances vasoconstrictor tone, um, can be caused by the high sugars in diabetics. So diabetics and hypertension occurs together in another vicious circle, which is why blood pressure has to be so carefully controlled 
in people who have diabetes, as well as other things such as the sugar. So to treat blood pressure, we can reduce the cardiac output, we can reduce the systemic resistance, and there's many ways we can do this. And here's some people in the audience will be on some of these drugs. Captopril, candesartin, amlodipine, very common. Um, you might be on a beta blocker or a propranolol. And um, these are working either to decrease the pressure or decrease the cardiac output. The second big killer is diabetes. And it's also a cause of great morbidity because you don't die of it nowadays. You live with it for many decades with cumulative damage if it isn't looked after properly. It's an old disease and it's believed that the physician Hesira from the Third Dynasty, who's actually buried in a tomb, had very, very unusual inscriptions because these inscriptions are on sycamore wood, not on stone. And they still exist and here's some pictures of them. It's at Saqqara where the Step Pyramid is which interestingly is where a lot of the Egyptian stuff comes from in, in many of the talks I was doing. This was a period of, of great artistic um, development as well as scientific development. Susruta in India described the disease about 500 BC, and he is also recorded as noting the sweetness of the urine, which was not going to be discovered until uh, Thomas Willis dipped his finger in and had a taste in the 1600s. Now, Arateus, the everybody's favourite Cappadocian, uh, was a contemporary of Galen, and he described the disease of constant thirst, polydipsia, excessive urination, polyuria, and loss of weight, and he called it diabetes. And what he implied by that was to stand legs apart. It also means a siphon. And so the urine was flowing out. This was a disease that was consuming your body, and you were passing the remnants of your body out into your urine. It was ultimately fatal, but thank God it was rare, and it remained rare for thousands, for a thousand years. In fact, it was ignored almost entirely in the medieval literature. Now, Ibn Sina or Avincena described the complications, and as I mentioned, Thomas Willis, actually. Mm, sweet, that's a bit salty. Um, and called it mellitus, meaning honey. So urine was obviously one of the ways that we can look inside the body. We can examine the skin, we can examine the pulse, but since we don't know anything about blood pressure for a medieval physician, this is a particularly useless thing to do. Skin can tell us whether someone's pale, yellow, very red, or tell us if there's a rash. We can look at the eyes, and that also is much more sensitive at looking at colour because we don't have skin pigmentation in the eye. You can look at the tongue, you can look at the faeces, and you can look at the urine. The least unpleasant of all of these was to look at the urine, and it became the most popular. And we see virtually any medieval depiction of a physician, someone will be holding a urine glass. And uh, these urine glasses were very, very special. Uroscopy was actually very ancient. It had been used by Sumerian and Babylonian physicians, but it became a real art in the medieval period. And in fact, the many colour wheels were generated to look at the different colours of urine. And some of these are the first examples that we have of colour gradations that are being used. You, we see them all the time now when you go and choose paint for, you know, or wallpaper, you have a swatch of colours. This was the first time swatches of colours were used for a very practical purpose. Even by the 17th century, urine and pulse taking were the only diagnostic tools available to physicians to access the health. The flask that they used had remained unchanged and it was called a macula. And each region of the flask corresponded with a part of the body. And you could, you know, using a chart like this, make some very sophisticated diagnoses. Here's a beautifully coloured chart that's in uh, the British Museum, um, round about the time of John Sommer and Robert Grossetest. Grosted, as we know him. And here are the, some of the diagnoses. You could look at the urine. If it was yellow, it meant you had a sanguine personality. We now think of yellow being due to bilirubin and urobilogen. They give a yellow colour to the urine, and it's a darker yellow if it's more concentrated, if you've not been drinking enough. Um, it goes very yellow if you eat lots of carrots or eat yellow dyes. It's meant to be a little bit more yellow in diabetics, but I'm not really sure about that because it seems to come in all colours, shapes and sizes in my diabetics, but I don't deal with urine testing so much nowadays. Um, and also some infections change it. White, the other colour, what they mean by that, colourless, is mortal in acute fevers. So if you pass colourless urine, you've got a high fever. You're in serious trouble in medieval Europe. Orange, death. So if you pass orange urine, prognosis, death. 
um, and a hectic fever in dropsy. And now, high levels of urobilogen are out here. Beetroot can also do this, and also porphyria and some medications. So there may be some sense if the urine is going orange in a high fever and you've got dropsy, heart failure, it could be an indication that things are going seriously wrong. Pinky red could meant that you had a choleric personality, as you can see up here, cholericus, and there's the pinky red urines. Um, and what you needed here was bloodletting to cure this. Um, we recognise red urine now as hematuria, that's blood in the urine, and this happens with bladder infections, bladder cancers. It can happen after extreme exertion when the kidneys can leak a little bit of red cells into the system. Trauma, if you get booted up in the back of the kidneys in rugby or you get your testicles squashed, you can also end up excreting blood in the urine, as many schoolboys can tell you, and also dyes and porphyria. Blue is a melancholic personality. Um, and this is the various bacterial products from stuff in the gut that can then be excreted into the kidneys called indoles, and then they can make the urine go a variety of interesting hues. Black, mortification due to extinguished natural heat. Doesn't sound healthy, does it? Alcaptinuria, medicines, and also taking the tree bark of the cascara tree. And brown is a multitude of corrupted humours, and, and, and so it goes on. They also diagnose some things milk-like, dropsy. This is what we'd recognise as cardiac failure today, and proteinuria can be a consequence of that. And turbid, the woman is not a virgin. Now, turbid urine occurs in urinary tract infections, which can often be stimulated by, uh, what was it called, honeymoon cystitis, which actually uh, probably is where that particular diagnosis came from. We've met Doe before. The dropsical woman is painting in the Louvre, and here we see the posh physician. We know he's a posh physician because he's wearing a hat and a coat that indicate that he's a degreed physician. And he's looking at the urine here. We laugh at this nowadays, but remember, it's 200 years before Hooke's going to invent the microscope and use it properly. Blood pressure's 300 years away. The stethoscope's 400 years away in the future. So these medieval physicians are doing the best they can and although we may laugh at some of them, some of them actually do carry a measure of sense. However, as always, there is a bunch of unethical physicians and charlatans who claim to predict the patient's prognosis based entirely just on the flask, and they abused this practice. And Thomas Bryan published The Piss Prophet, and he says, Certain piss-pot lectures wherein are newly discovered the old fallacies, deceits, and juggling of the piss-pot science used by all those, whether quacks or empirics, and on he goes, and he, he's never here to publish, and it's going to be sold by Ben Thrale at the sign of the Bible at the lower end of Cheapside, London, in 1679. So people were getting a little bit fed up with paying a lot of money for the physician who came around and said, you've got a choleric personality, you need to have bloodletting on the basis of the urine. And people are beginning to smell a rat, even in the early days. Um, there's some great examples from Wales, and this is a, a Welsh uh, document um, showing another chart. Unfortunately, the colours haven't survived over the years, but again, this circumference of colours. And we use it today. Here we are. Here's a bunch of different colours for measuring urine before we criticise these colour charts. And this is a modern uroscopy chart. So we have the urine down here, and we dip it in, and uh, we look at the colours, and then we match them up, and then we can say whether you've got protein, blood, ketones, nitrate, glucose, urobilogen, or bilirubin in the urine. You can actually look at the urine and you can smell it. Um, if it's fresh, it should have no smell. If it's been standing for a while, as anyone who goes to any pub around here knows, it's got a strong sense of ammonia. And it's slightly fishy if you've got a urine infection. In ketoacidosis, which you see in diabetes, it has a slight chemical smell to it, and you get a pear drop. This is occasionally noticed if you manage to misjudge the dose of whiskey the night before and um, go to bed a little late. The first urine in the morning can have a little slight chemical smell to it as you're excreting the remains of that whiskey. Colour could be straw coloured and clear normally, and if it's not, there's something wrong with you, and if it's cloudy, there's something really wrong with you. And this is used in uh, venereal disease clinics, of course, to look for threads of mucus to diagnose gonorrhea before we had more sophisticated tests. Now, the finding of sugar in the urine, as we mentioned before, Thomas Willis, um, and this is actually the original here where he describes it as mellitus. Unfortunately, it's very faded, but it will come out in the handout. William Cullen of Edinburgh distinguishes two types of polyuria, the sweet one, diabetes mellitus, and the tasteless one, which is diabetes insipidus, 
which is a completely different disease. And the number of people come up. Matthew Dobson evaporates two quarts of urine from a patient, and the residue is granulated and smells and tastes like sugar. And this conclusively establishes the presence of a saccharin material and diagnosis of diabetes. John Rollo, who's a Scots Surgeon General to the Royal Artillery, creates the first medical therapy to treat diabetes. He describes an animal diet which eliminates sugar. So you have plain blood puddings, fat and rancid meat, and you manage the disease with foods, and then you, know, you can get a cure of the disease. A really interesting experiment was done by Francis Holm when he fermented 24 pints of a diabetic's urine with yeast, and, and it actually made quite a tolerable small beer. <laughs> Now, it's clearly established that sugar has something to do with diabetes. And these 19th century chemical tests to detect it were getting close. But what can you do to, to help? Well, Bouchardé, during the um, period of the Franco-Prussian War, when Paris was besieged and people didn't have much food, apart from the occasional rat um, à la van, they found that they ran out of diabetic patients. And these people had lots of diabetic patients. They didn't have them anymore. So he then worked out, well, maybe a strict diet for people with diabetes could be helpful rather than the normal sort of French and Western diet. Um, interestingly, during this period, Paris was about to be completely demolished by the German artillery. But uh, General von Blumenthal, the Crown Prince and Moltke, opposed bombardment of this. All of them had married English wives, and as a result, the German public accused them of coming under English liberal influence. But thank goodness they didn't bombard and kill everyone there, otherwise we wouldn't have had the first diet for diabetes. Frederick Pavey um, published on this, and he had the largest number of diabetic patients in London, and concluded that there's a quantity, the more sugar, the more diabetes that you have. So William Gull said, what sin Pavey has committed or his fathers before him, that should he be condemned to spend the rest seeking a cure for an incurable disease. The pancreas was then discovered. Paul Langerhans, a German medical student, on a dissertation in the pancreas, he found it contained two systems of cells. One of them, these dark brown ones, occurred as islets, little islands in the sea of the normal pancreas looked at under the microscope. The pancreas is a yellow little organ that sits in the loop of the gut as it passes around from the stomach. Now, these islands of cells were called islets. Unfortunately, um, Langerhans develops tuberculosis, which he catches from a patient, and moves to Madeira, where he studies marine worms and becomes one of the world experts on marine worms. He marries a widow, blissfully happy for three years, and dies at the age of 40. In 1893, two uh, scientists at the University of Strasbourg realised that if you took the pancreas out of a dog, it got diabetes, and it died. But before it died, you noticed there were swarms of flies around the urine, sucking up the very sweet sugar. And there wasn't swarms of flies around the other dog's urine, which anyone who's got dogs will probably notice is true. 1704, he realised that it also made the dogs very thirsty and produced copious urine. So this finding, 190 years late, was predicated on one that was earlier. Similarly, Moses Barron did an autopsy on a patient who had stones in the pancreas and diabetes and concluded that there must be something in the pancreas that is needed to prevent diabetes in the normal person. Thomas Corley, surgeon to the force in Jamaica, had already described a similar case long before in 1788 in the London Medical Journal, and that's his article there. So the discovery of insulin really is what we're going for here. J.J. McLeod, in his fourth textbook, said the pancreas might be the seat of a hormone to control diabetes, but that it was more likely to be a tox detoxifying centre. Now, Banting, in 1921, was a First World War <laughs> surgeon. He was an orthopaedic surgeon. And he was preparing a lecture, and he was reading the article by Moses Barron, and thought, wow, it came to him in a dream. The pancreas is. There's something in the pancreas that's going to cure diabetes, and I'm going to find it. And so he does, by taking the pancreas out of dogs and ligating the pancreas. And then he finds out, if you take the pancreas out of the dog, it dies. If you ligate the pancreas, it doesn't. It gets bad digestion, but it survives. And then if you mash up that pancreas and take out a sterile solution of it, you can rescue the life of dogs who have no pancreases. They were elated. They discovered insulin. And within a year, this had gone on and been purified. And they described going down the wards. The wards had more than 50 patients a time on them, 
with their parents waiting to die, inevitably going to die. They were terribly sad places. As soon as they were died, another child was brought in and was nursed <coughs> until they died. They went round to inject, and they injected all these children. By the time they got to the end of the ward, the first ones were waking up out of their comas. An absolutely astonishing moment. They um, went on to get the Nobel Prize, and they gave it to MacLeod, who was the guy who was on holiday fishing in Scotland, and they'd borrowed his laboratory. And Best, the other First World War surgeon, who was a medical student, was ignored. And this infuriated Banting, and the team fell out. And this rancor exists even to this day, and it's one of the great Nobel controversies, of which we have another one brewing with China at the moment, so it's quite topical. Diabetes is a worldwide epidemic. Most people with this have type 2, which is related to your body mass, and the term diabetes has come into fashion, which actually goes back to those French findings. You know, you don't have diabetes when you don't have a diet that increases um, your body mass index. And in fact, weight gain of just 11 pounds double, you know, gives you a risk of diabetes 50% greater. So obesity and insulin resistant are working together, and this has a vicious circle with atherosclerosis, um, causing strokes, heart attacks, peripheral vascular disease, more hypertension, more disease and blindness. Now diabetes is terribly expensive to manage. 7.8% um, of Americans have it, 10% of the NHS budget, about 9 billion, and this is increasing. 24.8 million items were dispensed and cost 458.6 million from the NHS Information Center in 2004. But by 2009, this had nearly double to 35.5 million prescriptions, a cost of 650. However, untreated diabetes is even more expensive. So we've got to face this burden and we've got to look for it. One of the ways of treating it might be prevention. And another banting, interestingly, who's distantly related to the banting who discovered insulin is sitting here. And um, he found this diet in France. He was an enormous man, lived in Knightsbridge. He was an undertaker, went on this diet and found his diabetes went away. Now, we've mentioned about the eye before, and we're going to come and talk of it. Now, one of the interesting things about human eyes are, is they're black. Whereas if you look at animal eyes, often they are light. And nobody really knew why this was. They thought it was because the human eye contained a humor that was black. If you shine a light into an eye, the light is reflected and refracted out normally. But then if you go and put your head in the way, you can't see the rays coming in from behind you. So it looks black. So what you have to do is to try and get the light to come in from an angle. And you can do this, as Bakinji did here, as we see him contemplating the skull, um, by using his myopic glasses as a mirror. And he deflected the rays into the eye, and that enabled him to see the reflex. Now, he could see the reflex, but he couldn't see any detail. We see something similar when we take a picture with a camera, and the flash is just very slightly off the centre. We see a red eye. You've got to have enough illumination, because the human retina is not very reflective. It only sends out about one hundred thousandths of the light it receives, whereas animals have a reflective coat behind them that sends it out like a mirror. And here we can see an animal eye with a reflective white coat contrasted with a human eye that has this brown coat. So we've got to get out of the way of the light that's going into the eye. And one of the ways you can do it, you could put a tube into a candle. And he came very, very close to discovering the ophthalmoscope by doing this. But you need to also then form an image because this is just coming out. And to form the image, you've got to focus the rays. You can do this by drowning the cat underwater, which gets rid of the corneal refraction, or in humans, which you can't examine them underwater politely, you use a, a lens. And this condensing lens enables us to have a look and form an image. So there's three things needed here. We've got to have the light. We've got to illuminate the human retina. We've then got to stand in the way of the light rays coming out, which we can't if the light rays coming from behind us. So we've got to deflect the light rays or have a source that comes up. And until you have batteries and um, halogen bulbs, you couldn't do this. And then you've got to focus the image. And this was achieved by Charles Babbage in 1847. And this is a copy of his instrument. Unfortunately for him, he gave it to an ophthalmologist who didn't do anything with it. And um, the invention was lost. And Hermann von Helmholtz invented the Augenspiegel, the eye mirror. And he was looking with a lens here through a condenser and imaged the back of the eye. And this instrument was in use till the 1920s. 
here's an original Helmholtz. And here's a picture drawn by the Hamblin uh, Company's um, artist in the 1920s using this instrument. And you can see the way he's used plates of glass to deflect the light so it is not um, coming from behind him. In England, it was called the eye speculum, but in France, they called it the ophthalmoscope, the eye observer, and that name has stuck. Originally, there weren't any lenses for correcting. Some modifications came, and putting in these lenses here, this is an early ophthalmoscope. It's starting to look like the sort of thing you'll see in your doctor's office. And suddenly, they were able to look in the back of the eye, and they discovered what was going on with amaurosis. Up until then, amaurosis was a disease in which the patient didn't see anything because they were blind, and the physician didn't see anything because the eye looked normal. And amaurosis actually encompasses whole heaps of diseases, things like glaucoma, things like retinal detachment, things like retinal vasculitis, hypertension, diabetic maculopathy. All of these are amauroses that you cannot diagnose unless you can image the retina. So now we're beginning to see why this invention of imaging the retina was singly one of the most important inventions, not in ophthalmology, but in any field of endeavour. Now, the retinal vasculature is pretty tight. It doesn't leak. Normal vasculature isn't tight and leaks. In the retina, it doesn't. It has these very tight junctions between the lining cells. The other thing that can go wrong is further downstream, fatty little deposits can break off from large arteries, from your ureter or your carotid, and fly up and get stuck in tiny little blood vessels in the retina or in the brain and cause a stroke. Because it doesn't leak, fluorescein doesn't come out of the normal retinal vessels unless they're leaky when you've lost those tight junction cells, as I've shown. And you can see the yellow fluorescein, which has been injected intravenously, as you can see down here, is now coming out and leaking into the retina. The leaky vessels behind, as you can see on the eye, the brown layer, which I've now put as this brown layer of cells here, protects us from all the leaky fluorescein behind, unless there are holes in the brown layer. And when we talk about macular degeneration, which causes holes in the brown layer, we'll see some images from that, and that will explain what's going on there. But it's not the topic of this, because we're in the layers further in, which are the retinal layers. And down on the bottom here, you can see a black and white photograph of this leaking fluorescein. So diabetic maculopathy causes leakage, and it causes not just leakage of fluid, it causes leakage of fat. Fluid is invisible, it's very difficult to see, but where there's fat leaking, yellow blodges, there's also fluid leaking as well. And Edward Jaeger found this in 1859. This originally wasn't thought to be just purely due to diabetes, it was thought to be due to the hypertension, secondary to the diabetes, and it was much later until we realised that it actually was purely a diabetic. Diabetic maculopathy develops in most patients, um, after a while, if they've had it for 20, 30 years, um, usually it's mild, just a few little spots of hemorrhages and no visual significance, and it's a good time to catch it. It can go on, though, to form maculopathy, and maculopathy here is where we've got fluid leaking in the centre of the eye, which is the bit we use for reading and fine vision. And you can see a fluorescein angiogram above this showing these multiple tiny little abnormalities in the blood vessels that we can't see. And furthermore, you can see patches where there are no blood vessels which are black. There is no oxygen supply to these areas as well. And that's called ischemia or lack of oxygen. And if you get too much ischemia, you make abnormal blood vessels in response to it. And these abnormal blood vessels can bleed. And this is the same eye. Here I am, I've put on a bit of laser here. You can see the little tiny patches of white scars. I didn't get it on enough of it and quick enough, and he got a vitreous hemorrhage. And there is the blood. You can't see anything. You've got to wait for that to clear. It's like mulligatawny soup. If you get too much of this, it causes fibrosis and detaches the retina, and that is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And here we are seeing new vessels at the disc and elsewhere lighting up in this ischemic disease. Now, um, the treatment of this was tried by burning the eye using reflected sunlight. But that's a bit tricky and it's a bit complicated to use mirrors. So this chap came along with Mayor Schwickerath and he realised that the burns on the retina, which were caused by sunlight burns during the eclipse in 1945, looked like diathermy scars, which had been used in, since the 1920s 
And I can tell you earlier than that, because I've seen patients who had retinal detachments in the First World War fixed by the American surgeons who had been diathermied. So although it was described by Gonan in the 1920s, the technique was already in use by surgeons and was already being practiced in the First World War. So they'd use these um, to heat up the eye. Now, they found American Optical Corporation, they'd made a big xenon thing for, for movies. And uh, the problem was it was a bit dangerous because if you looked at it, you burnt your eyes and you couldn't see. But if you didn't look at it, it gave a very bright light. And Zeiss incorporated into this machine. I'm probably one of the very few living people in this country who's used this flipping machine. And it was enormous. You see the patient lying down. You aim over, you the xenon bulb on and then there's a mighty flash and a bang, and everybody jumps out, and this scorching light comes out and creates this massive burn on the back of the patient's retina. And you do this sort of half a dozen times, and that's the, the burning on the back, which is going to prevent and treat these proliferative changes. It's a great advance, but clearly is not ideal. And so laser was brought in, which performs much finer, tinier ablations. You can see here a retina that I've lasered here with these beautifully fine, precise laser burns, which has caused the new vessels in the distance to regress, which means this patient isn't going to get that horrible hemorrhage, and he's not going to go blind, and he's not going to get fibrosis. I have prevented him from going blind by 90%. This is a treatable disease if it's caught at this level. So that's the important thing. You could also stop them getting in the first place, which is to look after the diabetes properly. And if you do, and this has been shown by many trials, you do reduce the complication rate, but you've got to do it for a long time. This isn't an overnight stay. This is macular edema on the right. You can see the retina is full of fluid. It's bulging up. And then the little image on the other side here shows it back to its normal after we've done an intervention to get rid of the macular edema. But we don't want to do the intervention. If you do good diabetic control you will get less progression of retinopathy, and it's also good for the kidneys, and it's also good for the nerves. And the benefit persists for seven years after you've done this. So you then go back to your bad old ways, you go back to doing what the controls are, and seven years afterwards, if you examine those patients, they are still in a better position than the ones who never had that control at all. And that's a really astonishing finding. Furthermore, if you control the blood pressure, you're going to stop them getting lots of these complications. Initially, it thought you had to do it with one of those ACE inhibitors that we briefly alluded to earlier. It doesn't matter. you just got to lower the blood pressure, however you lower it. I suppose in the medieval days you did frequent bloodletting. But anyway, um, that also prevents progression. So hypertension is really important. And this is why hypertension is important, as we saw over this young patient. But also that's acute hypertension. What about long-term hypertension, hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis? Well, I mentioned little bits can fly off. And this arrow here, you can see a little bit has flown off. And you can see a white plaque in the retina, in the artery, occluding it. And that's caused a stroke. And he can't see, and that's his visual field, which is the mirror image of where the damage is, of course, as we've discussed in an earlier lecture. And you can get little mini-strokes occurring where you, you can see them. These are very fresh, and we've just got this patient in, in the early stages. You can also get thrombosis in the veins from hardening of the arteries. And here's a beautiful fluorescent angiogram showing all the capillary fallout can't see the capillaries there because they've all gone by the damage from this hemorrhage downstream from the clot. We can get a big hemorrhage as a, caused by a clot right in the middle. This is a central vein occlusion. And just very briefly, there are a number of other vascular diseases. This is retinopathy of prematurity, which occurs in preterm babies. Now, we are rescuing more preterm babies, younger and younger than we've ever done before. And some of these things are tiny little mites that fit in the palm of your hand. And we go round the wards to examine their retinas to identify this disease. And we can treat this disease and prevent them going blind. This was a uniformly blinding disease until quite recently. And you can see one here where they've had laser done. These are laser burns, these little spots, peripheral to this bar of abnormal blood vessels. These are new blood vessels developing in sickle cell retinopathy. A beautiful fluorescein angiogram courtesy of Optos Company who allowed me to use it for this lecture. You can get retinal vasculitis, and this is a, another lovely image showing inflammation causing blockage of the retina, and this causes lots of little tiny strokes and hemorrhages. And finally, another wide field image of multiple lack of oxygen and new blood vessels lighting up in the periphery. It's someone who has a very rare disease in this country called Eels disease, 
but it's much more common in India. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the retinal vascular system in context with the vascular system at whole. Hope you've enjoyed it. There's some beautiful images there. And go and get yourself checked for blood pressure. And if you've got diabetes, make sure you control it and get your eyes photographed every year. Thank you very much. Thank you.